rookie. Here is your flashlight king, fireworks commissioner, and the keeper of common sense, your mayor, Joe Sushir. Joe Sushir. I thought you were going to do it. I didn't know. See, I didn't want you to do it. Sit right down for Author's we're Corner. Author Let's on. all have some fun. Listen, look at Listen up face. to Sushire, because before you know it, it's done. <laughs> Jack, Jack, I... Sorry, sorry, Jack. I apologize. Those, I'm not. Those Author's Corner intros were done during the, the Vince Flynn era. We're speaking with Jack Carr, and I couldn't be happier. I love your work. Uh, I have one complaint. I wish you'd slow hmm. down. Well, <laughs> oh, really? Well, Jack, I read the Terminal List. Uh, I read True Believer. I read Savage Son, and then for some reason, I went a wall in the next three. And then picked up Red Sky Morning, which I just completed, which I th thought was terrifying, uh, absolutely terrifying. If you don't know uh, Jack Carr, he is. Uh, you're not the heir apparent to Vince Flynn, Jack. I think you're just the heir. Uh, it's just, uh, I hope I'm not insulting you with that. Uh, Vince was a great, great friend of ours. And I just am so happy you're on the scene because uh, you're filling a void that I was really missing. Oh, thank you. I mean, he was such a huge inspiration. I got to meet him once at yep. uh, SHOT Show, which is an industry show in Vegas for all the latest weapons and gear and, and that sort of thing that I always made a point to go to if I wasn't deployed, just to see what the private sector was doing, anything that we could possibly get that would give us a little bit of an advantage downrange in Iraq and Afghanistan. And he was there signing books. Yeah. And I think it was 2000, I want to say eight or nine, something like that. Yeah. But I waited till the end and now people do this to me, but I waited until the very end and then went up to talk to him and he could not have been kinder. Um, I knew I wanted to be an author at that point, but I didn't mention that at all. I just thanked him for writing these books and told him how much I love them. And it was the end of the show. So for people who have been there, it takes like, if you're at the back of that show, it can take like 45 minutes to walk out of that thing. Cause there's so many people there. Right. And we got to walk out together. So I got to spend 30, 40, 45 minutes with him walking. And I remember the one question I asked him, I said, uh, I've asked him a lot, but uh, the one that stands out is I asked him, do you ever wake up in the morning and think that you're going to open the paper and see that the events that you wrote about in term limits have come true? That essentially that someone used term limits as a blueprint. And he told me every day. Oh, boy. Yeah, wow. what, an, what an amazing guy. And actually I have right here, this is the first one I read. I read this on the way to Afghanistan. So yeah. I read this in uh, 2003. So I was a couple of years late uh, to find Vince Lynn. But then of course I've read all of them. And now I've collected them all in signed first edition hardcovers. Oh, wonderful. Uh, this is the one that he did before getting to Simon and Schuster. Yep. This is yep. the one, that early one right here with, with uh, someone named Jason Lewis from AM 1500. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't know. <laughs> I have no well, idea who that is. Political is. thriller. We've right never there. heard of him. Never. Jack, and then, I didn't even know he could read. <laughs> yeah. And then this is the one after he gets to Simon and yeah. Schuster. Yeah. This is the next one right here. So, um, yeah, what an amazing guy. And uh, I can tell you this on, the, on those ten minutes that you walked out with him, it was all sincere. That's he, not. Yeah, he wasn't. He full, wasn't full Jack, long. what you have to learn to do now is to drop names because no one could drop <laughs> yeah. a name better than vince even if it was the the king of jordan he'd say yeah we had a little wine and a cigar and <laughs> and it didn't sound bad it came off all right jack when you wake up in the morning are you fearing what you write is coming true well you know i don't think of it in those terms but i certainly do the research and the world gives me a lot to work with uh both on the international side and the domestic front as well. Uh, the senior level generals, admirals, uh, elected representatives, permanent Washington, the bureaucracy, uh, to say nothing of what our enemies are working on, what they're learning from watching us, uh, our response to, say, COVID, our response to a uh, summer of civil unrest, uh, to how we got out of Afghanistan, uh, all of these things that can be used to further divide us and exploit us. Uh, so I am certainly not at a loss for ideas, and I don't think I ever will be. Uh, the latest one, though, I delve into artificial intelligence, quantum computing, things that I really didn't have a touch point with in the military at all, uh, specifically as it relates to China. So I enjoy doing all this research. And does it scare me? I don't know if it scares me or not. It's more just a uh, it's the way of the world. 
And I'm just trying to turn these things into narratives that are entertaining, but also the ones that inspired me growing up, inspired me to go and research things that I thought either I should know more about, or the author is writing something in here that I know by context what it means, uh, but I don't specifically know. And that, that has led me on so many journeys over the years that has made me, I think, a better, better citizen. Jack, we learn, uh, or I learned in Red Sky Morning of an autonomous computer named Alice, and she'll only talk to James Reese. But what I learned to my regret is that Alice apparently had ap uh, appeared in one or more of the three books I've missed, which I've now ordered to get, bring myself back to speed. So it, does Alice in the real world, does an Alice exist? So the people that I talk to, um, they each and every one. So when you're doing some of this research, especially when it comes to classified programs and that sort of a thing, what you need to do is become a reporter, I found. And mm -hmm. I didn't have a touch point with any of this stuff in the military. I'm not really a technically savvy person. So I had to go out there and talk to people who worked in these industries, worked in government programs. And each one of them will tell you a little something or mm -hmm. a certain something. And if you talk to enough of them, they each do that, but they give you a little bit, a different hint. And so you get to piece this mosaic together. And then of course you go into those interviews knowing as much as you possibly can. So I've read it, read as many books as you possibly can, as many articles as you possibly can, journals that you possibly have, have read so that you can at least ask intelligent questions. So they say, okay, this guy has done as much research as he could uh, to at least ask these kind of questions. And you can read body language, you can do all sorts of things to piece this mosaic together. So I introduced Alice, the quantum computer in, uh, in the blood. And I would be shocked if what I describe in In the Blood isn't almost exactly like that in the real world. Well, there, there's the terrifying part for me. It's just incredible. Your hero, your great American hero is James Reese. And in every book, he has to be lured into action. He's, he wants to just settle in Montana, he, he thinks, but then he's always figure out, they, the Vic always figures out a way to bring him out of his, his hesitancy. And uh, I understand that in the next book, uh, I had an email on it from a guy named Pat Donahue, uh, who uh, was a good friend of Vince too, that you, is Reese not in the next book? I'm going back. I'm going back to 1968 to his yeah. dad, SEAL in yeah. Vietnam. Tom and Reese. Tom Reese and cover his transition from the SEAL teams into the CIA in that period, late 60s, early 70s. But for the first one, I'm going to focus on 1968 because it was such a pivotal year. Right. Uh, so many things happened in that year. So I'm going to set it, set it there. And what's great about that is that every chapter, you don't have to think about, oh, is this person driving a Tesla? Does this vehicle have a GPS in it? Are there cameras everywhere? Does this person have a phone? All of those things you have to think of when you're writing political thrillers today, uh, you don't have to think about those things back then. You can go back to old school type tradecraft. Uh, you can have someone running around looking for whatever change. And I, I don't think you think it was a quarter in 1968. That's research that I have to do. What did you have to find? Was it a dime? Was it a What did you have to put into a payphone to make a call back then? And you can go in uh, and not have to consider all that technical thing, all the technical things you have to think about today if you're writing an espionage type of a thriller. So like I'm old LeClaire books. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, Cold War thrillers. Yeah. Yeah. Jack, there's a great strain of anti-wokeism in your work, uh, which I appreciate mightily. Uh, you don't suffer fools gladly when it comes to wokeism, uh, nor do you suffer fools gladly when it comes to uh, political life. Uh, I'm just wondering what you think of the current situation in the country right now. Oh, my goodness. I mean, like I said, they're, they're giving me a lot to work with. Yeah. Certainly give me a lot to work with. Unfortunately, I say that. Uh, uh, if you had written about what's really happening in this country right now, if we'd done that, let's say, as an author 10 years ago. If Vince had written something like that in, let's say, 2006, 7, 8, right. uh, people wouldn't have believed it. You'd have to tone right. it down quite a bit. Uh, and yet it's our reality today unfortunately um the one that i go back to a lot of of course in the in the books is uh how we dealt with iraq and afghanistan specifically our withdrawal from afghanistan the lack of accountability associated with that withdrawal uh and i take it back even further a lot of times in discussions between certain characters and go back to the reorganization of our military and intelligence apparatus back in 1947 and really after that there's been uh, a lack of accountability associated with our uh, incursions overseas something that didn't really happen 
happened up until that point. I mean, uh, President Lincoln went through general after general until he got to Grant. Uh, George Marshall also went through general and admiral after general and admiral until he got to all those names that we know who led us to victory in World War II. Uh, and then for some reason in 1947, as we continue to grow the power of these bureaucracies, uh, the intelligence and military apparatus, that accountability trails off uh, until we get to what we saw in Afghanistan with our own eyes, zero accountability. And that was the best that these guys could do after 20 years of preparing. Mm -hmm. Unacceptable. Jack, in Red Sky Morning, we learn a great deal about how much the U.S. and China know about each other. And I gather you base that on the people you talk to about this. Well, I certainly did. And of course, there's a lot of books that uh, go into the different connections between uh, our uh, political uh, elected representatives. I don't like to call them leaders because they're elected representatives, not leaders, and their families even that go back to uh, businesses or other entities in China or with direct relations to China uh, and how China's really played the long game with us, exploiting uh, the gaps in, uh, in our society. So uh, all that's out there and it's out there for, for anyone to, to research without putting in actually too much work. Uh, and those connections between China and uh, essentially the political class, the elite political class in this country is strong. Unfortunately. When in God's name do you have time to read? Ah, well, I, I heard Lee Child say when he retired that the thing that he was most looking forward to was mm -hmm. being able to read for pleasure again. Right. Because now I'm reading for research uh, or for a podcast guest or someone asked me to give them a blurb and I try to do that for, for pretty much everyone that, that asks. Um, and so a lot of it is essentially work um, and not me sitting there kicking up my feet uh, in front of the fire with a bourbon or sitting in a hammock outside on a, on a lazy afternoon, just reading a book like I used to read back in sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth grade, just reading them for the magic in those pages. So I understand what he was talking about now because uh, the, the time that I spend now is really focused on a project. You're in your, are you in your home library right now in Park City? I am. I am. This is the nonfiction section, aside for uh, Ian Fleming right here. Well, and there's a very it's... conveniently placed Jack Carr novel right, oh, really? right oh, over your left shoulder. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> is that product that's placement? Yeah. I think that's just wise. You I don't also know. Have, you just released nonfiction book about Beirut. I did. I did. I saw what Tom Clancy did in the 80s, essentially, with his flagship novels, starting with Hunt for Red October in 1984, and then Red Storm Rising, and then Patriot Games, and Cardinal of the Kremlin, Clear and Present Danger. And then in the early 90s, he diversifies into nonfiction with Submarine. Mm -hmm. And then he has two nonfiction series, essentially, a guided tour series and a study and command series. So I always knew that I would branch off into the nonfiction space. I'm just, uh, I've been a student of history my entire life. And when I thought I'd built up enough political capital with Simon & Schuster, I pitched the idea of the targeted series that looks into different terrorist events that essentially change the course of history. And I wanted to take the lessons from those events and also humanize them. So I kept coming back to Beirut 1983 as such a pivotal time in our relationship with the larger Middle East, specifically with Iran, uh, mm. because it taught Iran a lesson and it taught them that terrorism works. And it didn't just teach Iran that, it taught terrorist organizations around the world that, taught other countries that, taught super empowered individuals that, because Iran got a political end, the political end that they wanted, through the use of proxies. So they set the rules really that we've been playing by ever since. So that seemed like the logical place to start this series, Beirut 1983. And it was an emotional experience writing this book as well. Uh, all the interviews, the family members, because the decisions made in the Oval Office back then, they had real tactical level, multi-generational implications, uh, not just for the guys who died, but for the people who were digging for their buddies through the rubble with their hands, with their K-bar knives, maybe a shovel or a crowbar if they could find it. Uh, so it was a very emotional book to write. And I wanted to be as thoughtful and respectful as I possibly could, knowing that uh, kids would be reading it who lost a father there. Parents would be reading it who lost a son there. And uh, on the book tour, people would come through with a picture of their father who they lost that day, a picture of their wow. son who lost that day. And there was hugs and tears and all the rest of it. So it was a very emotional uh, book to write uh, and could not be uh, more pleased with, with how it came out, actually. it's uh, You are a Navy SEAL for 20 years. I was. It was you good. It was to one 20 in a wake up, I say. 20 in a wake up. That's it. You have to... You, you have to be calling on much of your own experience in these books. 
and not in the way that I thought at the beginning. I thought when I first started that I'd get the sniper weapon system stuff right. If I didn't right. know how a helicopter or an aircraft worked or a submarine, I could at least reach out to someone who did. Um, but as soon as I started writing the first words, I realized how much of an emotional writing experience it was going to be and how personal it was going to be. Mm -hmm. Not because I'm recounting exact things that happen, but let's say my character gets ambushed in Los Angeles, California. Um, right. I don't have to go back and try to find someone who was in an ambush and then talk to them about it and figure out how they thought about it or what they did. I just remember what it was like to be in an ambush in Baghdad 2006. And I take the feelings and emotions behind that experience and I apply them to a completely fictional narrative. So for someone reading it, if it, reels, if it reads like it's true, it's because the feelings and emotions are true. Uh, and I think that's really uh, been a differentiator to me. So, Jack, that's where I'm assuming I'm in the I'm ending Savage Sun right now. And I really love the mocking and the back and forth about the 1911. That's where that what you're talking about came from, because guys love giving each other crap about whatever they're shooting. And one guy shoots something because it has an emotional attachment. And the other guy is like, well, are you gonna, are we going to club the deer today? Why are you bringing that thing out to the deer? You know, that kind of uh, knowledge about weaponry. But what I also love about Savage Son is you made a villain very, very interesting. And I've worked through all the old Cold War thriller authors, um, Vince and Lee Child and Daniel Silva. But this villain you have in Savage Son I, I shouldn't say this, but I just love him because he's so awful. It's just the Russian in the in the the uh, Russian yeah. the the son, yeah. yeah, and what he does. And I don't want to give away the details for anybody that hasn't read it. But my God, that villain is so interesting to me. Thank you. Well, I try to put myself in the shoes of the people that I write about, whether they're the good guys or the bad guys, protagonists, antagonists, and write from their perspective and then give them a bit a backstory that uh, puts yeah. them in the position that they're in now, gives them their perspectives uh, on life or geopolitics or whatever it might be uh, to humanize them a little bit. And some people get very upset with that. They say, like you said this about Russia. Uh, well, because it's a Russian character's perspective. Uh, sure, yeah, yeah. We spent X number of years in the intelligence community is interacting with this politician or that person in the military or whatever it might be. But I like to give those backstories. Uh, and I think Vince liked to do this too. He liked to give backstory and then kill the person. And people yes. have said to me time and time again <laughs> that I do the same thing. And that certainly wasn't conscious, but it's, uh, it's possible that I got it from uh, just from Vince being a part of my experience, just like all these books I read growing up are now. Uh, but I love, to, I love to do that. I love the backstories because the, the protagonists are essentially the same people each book. Maybe there's some new ones in there. Uh, uh, each book might have a couple, but the bad guys, because James Reese pretty much kills everybody each book all yeah. the time. So they're they new. The difference. Yeah, so yeah. they're new every time. So I get to know yeah. a new bad guy or new bad guys every single book, which is uh, which is fun for me. Jack, do you think there's a bit of James Bond in Reese in the sense that Reese can do anything? If he stumbled upon a dilapidated helicopter in the jungle, he'd figure out how to fly it out. Can you do the things Reese does? Well, I certainly cannot. Uh, he okay. is much, uh, we, we meet him in the first book where he is probably on his last deployment to Afghanistan when disaster right. strikes. Uh, it's going to be the last time he's going to tactically maneuver guys in, on the battlefield. And he's probably going to come home and take care of his family from then on out because that's what he's good at is the tactical level decision making um, and the kicking in the doors, that sort of thing, which is where I was when right. I started fighting. I'd gotten back from my last Iraq deployment. That was going to be the last time because of the rank that I had achieved that uh, tactically maneuver guys on the battlefield i knew it was time to turn the page on that part of my life and to uh start a new chapter uh, as an author and focused on my family because the uh, pendulum was on the side of the team for so many years because it has to be uh because when you're taking guys down range that's what you owe them their families uh their because decisions you make are going to have once again those multi-generational implications so you have to be as prepared as you possibly can but you can't leave anything on the field when it comes to preparation so um that's and once again that's the, that's the power of popular culture i didn't want to be that character i'd seen in movies on tv and in books growing up who was sitting on that couch wondering if he could have done something different let's say back in vietnam uh that would have done that would have had a different outcome for his platoon or his troops downrange and i so i was very aware of that and i didn't want that to be me I wanted to at least I know, hey, if the enemy gets a vote and something goes disastrously wrong, it's not because I didn't prepare and I wasn't prepared as I possibly could.
could be. So uh, is James Reese like James, like James Bond? Well, certainly in my 007th book, which is Red Sky Morning, <laughs> yeah. I, I weave in a lot of Bond themes. Uh, as oh, a yeah, he does a lot of stuff. To James Bond uh, and Ian Fleming, his creator. So I put some things in there that the most casual watcher of a film will be able to catch. And then things even the most ardent Bond fan of film and the books will be able to find. And, uh, and that's all woven into the story. And that was very fun to do as well. Where did you grow up? Uh, Northern California. I keep it there because it's uh, you know it's so easy to find someone these days and, and all of that. So grew up in Northern California, uh, but started reading Tom Clancy when it, when Hunt for Red October first came out. And yeah. so because this was the 40th anniversary of that book in 2024, uh, that's why the first chapter or the prologue is a submarine battle essentially. And I knew nothing about submarines, and right. that that chapter probably took me months to write because of all the research it took. And then talking to different people who were in the submarine community who gave me like 180 out answers on certain things. And mm -hmm. so I kept changing it around and moving things. And eventually I thought, okay, I've done all this research. I've talked to all these people. I'm just going to write it and, right. uh, and it's going to be what it is. So uh, instead of keep changing things around because someone gives me a different answer to a, to a question. What did your dad slight. do for a living? Hmm. He was an attorney. Okay. Did mom work? Yeah, mom was a librarian, and so I grew up surrounded by books and a love of reading, uh, which is you can probably tell from the the background here. But you got quite uh, the library behind you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, mostly the nonfiction section, all the the fiction in there that I'm now collecting. All the first editions signed of all the paperbacks that I read growing up. Uh, that's the other other you side. Have a ladder in your library. I is certainly. There a ladder? I'm most afraid to move this around because uh, there's a ladder right okay, there. That's a, to me, oh, that's no. a big sign. If you got a ladder in your library, you've made it. If you got a ladder. <laughs> You oh, not only the, have a lot of books. There's the bar over there. <laughs> Show me the bar again. <laughs> What's the stuff hanging on the wall? I don't really get. Uh, it's it's such a mess right now because I'm oh, doing research. My next book. Yeah. There's the bar over there. Yeah. But uh, I don't get a chance to partake as much as I would like because uh, I'm, I'm writing all the time. Can we go to your gun safe next? Yeah. Let's go to the gun safe. <laughs> that's, I, that's, that's what classified. I want to see. That part's certainly. <laughs> yeah, I thought is so. that your uh, <laughs> is that your writing room as well? This is the where idea was that this would be the writing room, and then the other side would be the where I do the business side of things. Uh, right. Hasn't worked out that way yet because that's still filled with boxes and books everywhere. It's a complete disaster. Uh, but my eventually, I would like to get it cleaned up so that that side is the business side, and this side is only for writing. I do have a computer that I use just for writing, uh, and I get a new computer every book uh, for whatever reason. That uh, it's probably not the most uh, you know financially responsible thing to do, but yeah. that's what I do. Uh, it's a new one that is only for the next book that I'm writing. So, uh, what's so your writing that. schedule? Well, I should be writing right now, okay. but you guys are amazing. <laughs> I wanted to hang out for a bit, so that's not <laughs> happening today. Uh, so it's, it, I haven't figured that part out either. Uh, most of the books have been written between, let's say, ten at night and three in the morning. Oh, really? For this last book, because that's when the family is in in bed sleeping. That's yep. when everyone else, uh, essentially in New York and California, are also uh, sleeping or haven't gotten up yet. And that's when I'm the most productive because there are less distractions. Even though I put my phones in another room, I put this computer in another room, and I only have the computer on which I write. I think there's a little bit of bandwidth that gets taken up wondering about uh, what emails are coming in or what I need to respond to or what I'm missing. And between ten at night and three or four in the morning, that doesn't exist. So I. I'd like to get on a better schedule. I don't think that's the most healthy way to go. So All for right. any writing right. advice, don't uh, don't take that. Are you a notes guy? Do you take notes throughout the day? I do my my uh, I send my send notes via an email to myself to an email that only is on that writing computer. Sure. So, yeah. uh, so there's nothing else cluttering it up. So that's I'm sure, once again, I'm sure there are better ways to do it, but that's the way that I've been been doing it. And my process has been the same way from the very beginning. Uh, title. Because I don't want to be think, typing away thinking, oh gosh, I need to come up with a good title. I've had good titles thus far. And I don't want to take anything away from the story, from all my bandwidth going in to creating the best story that I possibly can. So I have a theme and a title right off the bat. I write down the theme, put it on my computer so it's there to guide the writing process. So everything can come back to that theme uh, directly or more importantly, indirectly. And then I write a two page, or a page, two paragraph uh, kind of summary of the book, something that you would read on the back of a paperback as you're walking through the, the airport if you grab it off the shelf or yeah. on the flat jacket of a novel. And I ask myself, 
is this book worth the next year, year and a half of my life? Is it is, is it is it interesting enough that I will uh, love spending a year and a half on this? And then I read it again and I say, if someone were to grab this off the shelf at a Hudson News, would they then think that this is interesting enough to spend time in these pages, time that they're never going to get back? Uh, and if the answer is yes or probably, then that's that's my my next story. And I take that, turn it into the outline, and then turn the outline into the narrative. You know that's how I'm judging you. The, the the opening prologue, you're being judged in that first paragraph. And if I make it for, through the first paragraph, then am I going to make it through the prologue? And then that, you know, then the race is on. That's how I judge authors. Yeah. Okay. Well, now I'm nervous. Now you made me nervous. I've never been nervous. Well, I, I'm don't, almost Jack, done. Don't pay any attention to him. He has to. He moves his lips when he reads. Uh, <laughs> what's What's next for you? Are you thinking about movies, screenplays? And well, who plays your guy? We should say that uh, uh, the Don't. Terminal List is a Netflix series. It's currently available. Okay. It's yeah. Amazon Prime uh, series with Chris Pratt. Amazon, all right. The, uh, their number one show, summer of 2022, when it came out. So Chris Pratt was the only person I wanted to play the role, and I actually chose him uh, as I was writing the first sentences in December of 2014 while I was still in the military, no wow. connection to publishing. Uh, he hadn't done Guardians of the Galaxy, hadn't done Jurassic World. He'd been on Parks and Rec, and then I saw his transition to a Navy SEAL in Zero Dark Thirty. Zero Dark Thirty, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, this guy needs to do this for his career. I want yeah. someone, and of course, like two, two sentences in, uh, and I think this guy needs to do it for his career, and I want someone to play this role who hasn't done something like this before. And I thought about Tom, uh, to Tom Hanks in the 80s doing all comedy and then taking a risk with Philadelphia in the early 90s and then essentially being able to do whatever he wanted. And I thought, I want an actor that is in that position. Uh, and I want him to be inherently likable. And I think somewhere I saw that Chris Pratt was a big uh, supporter of our military and law enforcement. Um, so that probably factored in as well. And then since I was choosing my actor, I thought, well, I might as well choose my director. Uh, and I thought Antoine Fuqua. Would be amazing. I love Training Day and uh, Tears of the Sun and uh, Shooter, based on uh, the book Point of Impact by Stephen Hunter. And I thought oh, uh, Antoine Fuqua he will direct. And years later, right before the book is published, like four months before the first book comes out, I get a call from a SEAL buddy of mine who I hadn't talked to in five years. His name is Jared Shaw, and he called and said, "Hey, do you remember me?" And I said, "Of course, I remember you." Uh, and he said, "Do you remember what you did for me in the SEAL teams?" And I said, "No, I, I, I don't remember at all." He said, "Well, you're the only person when I told you that I was getting out of the military. Uh, you're the only person that sat me down in your office, talked about moving into the private sector. You introduced me to people in the private sector, and then you followed up with me to see how I was doing. No one else did that. I always wanted to say thank you." And I said, "Hey, no problem. How's it going?" And he said, well, it's going great, but I heard you wrote a book. And I said, it's coming out in a few months. I have this galley copy thing I can I can send you. It's like an early edition. And he said, I'd like that, but I'd like to give it to a friend of mine. And I said, yeah, who's that? And he said, Chris Pratt. And I said, yeah. Oh, <laughs> no, you're <laughs> kidding me. Uh, that's, that's pretty convenient for me because uh, really I decided uh, that I wanted to play this role. So he got it. That was November of 2017. Uh, Jared read it. He gave it to Chris in December. Chris read it December 2017, called the first week in January 2018, wanting to option it. Um, and then off we went to the races. And we just finished filming Dark Wolf, which is a prequel to the events of the Terminal List. Just finished filming that in Budapest and working on the scripts for True Believer, which is the, uh, the second book in the series. And we'll start filming that in early 2025. And Are you surprised at all? All by this success you know I, I don't like answering that question because it makes you seem kind of I didn't think of anything else because when I'm reading these books growing up I'm reading these ones that say number one New York Times bestseller across right. the top uh, and so for me if you're reading that at 11 years old 12 years old 13 years old I didn't think that I would ever not be there okay uh, so it was very natural for me to think, oh, of course, I'm going to write books like these that I'm reading. They're going to make them into movies. Uh, and and part of the allure back then was really that you got to write these books. It seemed to me, let's say, in a cabin in the woods, send mm -hmm. it off to New York, maybe do one interview, uh, and then go back to writing again. And that was very appealing to me. Uh, and of course, as I got closer to publication, I realized we do not live in 1975, 1985, 1995 anymore. And you need to do the things that one would need to do for any business today in order to reach an audience, unless you are a uh, an, an outlier like a Fifty Shades of Grey or a Twilight or something along those lines. Um, but if you're going to have to do the things that anyone would have to do, that's building, let's say, a computer in their garage in 1977. You have to be the 
CEO, the CFO, the CMO, if there was social media, you'd be doing that and you'd be building the product at the same time. So uh, it's very entrepreneurial in nature, I would say. And then you get to a certain stage where I think I am now where you change that more into a business because you have to put structures in place. Otherwise, you're going to be running around like a crazy person all the time uh, and not focus on what you need to be focused on which is the writing, which is the product. And people are trusting me with time that they're never going to get back. So that is something that I am, uh, I take extremely seriously. Uh, and it's, it's also why I concentrate only on the story. And I never think about grabbing a headline or what's popular short chapters or long chapters, or am I going to alienate a certain part of the audience? If I say this, none of that ever comes into play. It is mm -hmm. all about the story. And if it's all about the story, then I am honoring those people who, and respecting those people who are, spending time with me time that they're never going to get back that's cool do you have to start writing or can you stay with us through a break i can stay absolutely all right we're going to take a short break and we're visiting with jack carr the latest book is red sky morning and that's m-o-u-r not m-o-r-n it's it. m-o-u-r got it uh i have great news though about the center of the american experiment the golden turkey awards are underway you have until november 1st to submit your example of minnesota's worst folly in spending we waste a lot of money in minnesota and uh, this is your chance to come up with the best waste of money submit it to the center of the american experiment you could win the golden turkey award there should be a nice award this year a trophy or something the finalists will be named on november 1st and then on november 27 here on garage logic we'll name the 2024 Golden Turkey Award winner. Go to the American Experiment. That's one word, americanexperiment.org slash golden turkey. All right, I'm ready to come back. I just need to do an insertion. All I'll right. be ready to rock. Can Jack hear me right now? Yeah. Jack, I couldn't be happier and more uh, uh, pleased that you decided to join us. I really wanted to talk to you. Oh, such an honor for me, uh, especially to talk to people familiar with Vince's work. And uh, I mean, I have such respect for, for him. Well, and everyone. right here, Rook, our, our guy, Rookie, went to school with Vince Flynn. Oh, no kidding. Uh, yeah, we, we've known Vince. Vince always did this show first for every single book he did. I knew that. I saw that. I, yeah. I, I was like, oh, my gosh. So that's I read that in my schedule and thought, oh, my gosh, this is incredible. But the problem is Rook tries to take credit for coming up yeah. with the character. I Mitch told Rapp. I said, Flynn, what you should do is this guy Rick and Ed <laughs> See, here we go. Is this is Mitch Rapp. That's he's a, bullshit. He's a, short, <laughs> he's a short order cook and he hates Arabs or something like that. You know, and, and uh, I said, you stole it from me. We were up at O'Gara's one night and it just he right. ripped me off completely. I'm ready. Right. Let's go. Let's Jack, go. Uh, Pratt seems like he's a lot of fun. Have you hung out with him? He seems like a blast to hang out with. Such a great guy. We were just over in Budapest together filming the final episode of the show. Fun. So we stayed up, uh, yeah, much much too late together uh, and had a great time talking about the, the future of the series, what we wanted to do with True Believer as we're writing those outlines right now, getting yeah. ready to those outlines into the episode scripts. Uh, so, yeah, he's fantastic. Just cool. such a humble, nice guy, guy you want to have and a few with. Foul mouth, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah yeah uh i mean just a normal dude you know just, uh, just and he's from dude. minnesota yeah. i didn't know chris pratt was from virginia minnesota. Well, i didn't know oh, that. really let's well, uh hey, let's I hate start to interrupt the show this here. off your portion let's I'm just come back record I'm chris come back. It's time for, for me here's corner nah. with joe sushery right. and this one uh, is a strike don't subject uh jack carr to this this <laughs> that's he's just, part of the crew now. he's respected author he's in the club now Jack, you more than any author, I'm comfortable saying that, uh, you identify the manufacturer of every piece of equipment, it seems, that is used in the book. And at first that irritated me. Then I began to like it because I knew exactly. I mean, you, you'll even describe the manufacturer of a water bottle. Uh, <laughs> it, and clothing, the brands of clothing. And, and explain to me why, why you do that. It would be very unnatural for me not to do that. Okay. Uh, some people like it, some people don't. But once again, it doesn't matter for me. It's all about the story and all these things to me uh, help inform the character. Because when I right. see someone, let's see, walk on a range and I see that person and they have a leather holster, leather belt, cocked and locked, 1911, uh, that tells me something about them. 
cowboy boots, jeans, whatever they're wearing, tells me something about how they've trained, maybe who they've trained with, even depending on you know what their hat uh, their hat is, what kind of shoes they're wearing, what kind of watch that they have, sunglasses that they're wearing. All those things tell a story about what kind of car they pull up in. All those things tell me something about the person more so than if the person pulls up in a car, has a gun in a holster. Uh, wow. That's don't a great me. answer. Yeah, you're right. You're uh, right. Ian Fleming was really the first person to do that, that I that I know of anyway. He wove in uh, specific manufacturers of gear, of, uh, mm -hmm. of, of watches, coffee, uh, all sorts of things in his in his books, uh, alcohol. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if I got that from him or not, but I think it's just more because I'm a gear guy. I was a gear guy before I went in the SEAL teams, always interested in gear, uh, always trying to use something that, let's say if I'm backpacking through the Sierras or whatever with my, with my family, uh, a different kind of backpack or the newest backpack out there uh, mm -hmm. some outside magazine or backpacker magazine in the in the 80s uh and then the seal teams of course it gets a lot more serious and i'm a gear guy there as well trying to find anything that is going to give us that edge against our enemies downrange so uh it's very natural for me to continue to be a gear guy going forward in life in general so uh, all of those things tell a story the cars uh the, the the weapons and also it works the other way too i can describe someone uh certain gear that that person is using that really tells the story that this person does not know what they're doing with these yeah. so hi i'm kenny <laughs> do you have great optimism or great of faith in our military? Do you believe our military is uh, uh, as advanced as it possibly can be and is capable of any, any task? Well, uh, uh, capable of any task, yes. Yeah. So there's a difference between that uh, capability and then the leadership that is exercising those capabilities. Are you hopeful for our leadership? No, uh, right. because it is a bureaucracy that over time has just got grown even larger and uh, more powerful to to an extent, but uh, it doesn't really reward uh, innovation, risk taking. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. uh, a lot of those people get out early on because they see the path ahead and realize they don't want any part of that. They want to do the stuff that they saw in movies and books as a kid. Uh, and then when they get to the staff level type jobs at the 10 year mark or so, then it's time to get out and move on. Um, and people are always surprised when I tell them that if you want to rise to the highest levels, uh, probably not just in the military, but my experience happens to be the military. Um, all you really have to do is uh, not get too many DUIs, not pop positive on a drug test. Um, um, and not get arrested for some sort of spousal abuse. And if you do those things, you can essentially continue to rise through the ranks to the very top of our military. Do you believe that uh, this DEI movement has uh, been embraced by the military leaders? It certainly looks like that when you yeah. hear questions from uh, from Congress and these guys are on the, the hot seat for, for a few minutes at a time. Um, anything that does not continue to prepare us for war, because really the job of the military is to be prepared to go to war. That's the job of the military. Uh, and anything that takes away from that, from those levels of readiness or time that could be spent making someone a better, in my case, better operator, or let's say a better tank driver, a better pilot, whatever that is, uh, anything that takes away from that needs to go by the wayside. And some of the excuses that these guys, senior level military leaders use as to why they think some of these things will do that are absolutely ridiculous mm -hmm. at face value. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I try to remain hopeful, but uh, yeah, the leadership of recent years really has has not uh, has not done anything to, uh, to, to make me more, more hopeful, I guess you could say. Jack, too, guys like James Reese and Reacher and Mitch Rapp and Gabriel Alon, do they exist? Are, th are they real? Are there people like that? There are people out there like those characters that you describe. I don't know about uh, Jack Reacher traveling from town to town in a bus. As wonderful as that is, the old Western motif, Stranger Comes to Town, uh, right. which, uh, which we all love. Um, but like a Gabriel Alon or a James Reese or a uh, Mitch Rapp or uh, these guys like that. Uh, there are people out there, I wouldn't say every year they get into the kind of scrapes that are described in these books. There are people out there with those capabilities operating in the shadows. All you need to do is look at the CIA memorial wall um, to know that each one of those stars is tied to something that is most of which are still classified to this day. And uh, those are the guys who are out there doing the job, uh, special operations guys at the highest levels out there doing the job. Uh, so these guys do exist. They are out there. And uh, it's really 
how they're being utilized. Um, that's 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 the key component. See, I want to believe James Reese is out there. We need James. Yeah, Reese. and I want to believe that the CIA is as badass in real life as it is right here in my brain. You know. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's uh, popular culture certainly uh, takes probably certain elements of what's happening out there and then turns them into a story that has a beginning, middle and an end and probably an end that not all the time, but a lot of the time uh, ends up with you leaving the theater with that hope that we described and hoping that there's another movie out there that's coming yeah. soon. Uh, Tom, Reese, Tom Reese will not have to face any of the DEI stuff, will he? That's 1968. He he's pre-wokeism. He well, when, will, when will that book be released, Jack? That should be June of 2025. So, so you're still working on it. Yeah, I'm still working on it right now. So I'm yeah. juggling that writing that and then the scripts for True Believer at the same time. Those are the two. Could, will we see oh, James yeah. Reese again in the future? Oh, that's a great question. And well, so, so you ask, shouldn't ask that. I might be following the ending. Of the ending. Tell, me the ending. Tell me the ending right now. How's that page 428 go at the uh, bottom? So um, I should probably I should probably not answer that question just because uh, of that. But all right. All I will right. say that someone once asked Ian Fleming at his estate in GoldenEye, Jamaica. They mm -hmm. asked if there's a black and white video out there you can find online. And they a reporter asked him, will we ever see the end of James Bond? And Ian Fleming, who had that big, big cigarette out there on its holder, and he and he took a took a puff of that thing, and he said, "My dear chap, I couldn't possibly afford it." <laughs> so, Jack, I can't thank you enough. No, we're right. not done. We're All not right. done. All right, we're not done. Well, Jack you, might be. You brought up um, Zero Dark Thirty and Pratt, and I've seen that movie a hundred times. And my the favorite part is when from the when they bring in the team to the very end. Now you've been in those situations. How real did they depict that when they flew over, dropped into the compound, got him and got out of there? You've been in those situations. Was that pretty close to the truth? Yeah, you know, I only saw it once when it was in the theater, right when it came out. Uh, yeah. I know a lot of the guys who were were on that mission. Um, and of course there were some Hollywood. I, I couldn't tell you exactly what it was right now, but I remember leaving the theater thinking, yeah, there's some Hollywood in there. But you know what they got right is that uh, these guys are going in on this mission. It's a mission, very similar profile to what uh, special operations forces and conventional forces uh, have been doing for, for 20 years, night, day in, uh, day out, night in, night out, um, in particularly in Iraq and Afghanistan primarily, but not, not only Somalia, other places around the world as well. And in this particular mission, all of these guys that I talked to anyway, uh, that were there, they didn't think they were coming home. And uh, oh, wow. they went anyway. And I think- oh. that that's the biggest takeaway from that mission that night going cross border into Pakistan um, is that they didn't think they were coming home. And oh, they did wow. you, did wow. you have missions where you thought you weren't coming home? You know, any mission you go on, mm. you might not come home. You know, anytime you leave the house, you, there, there's nothing's guaranteed in life. Uh, but you don't dwell on those things because you have a responsibility uh, to those guys you're leading on this mission. Uh, and that's taking away bandwidth from being focused on the mission. So anything could have been an IED during those years uh, mm -hmm. in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, particularly during the, the height when the IED threat was, uh, was, was, was at its utmost, uh, when the EFPs were coming in from Iran across uh, uh, rat lines, centuries old rat lines, essentially, and uh, EFPs were explosively formed penetrators, IEDs that could defeat our most advanced armor. Um, but anything could have been a dead donkey on the side of the road, a pothole, a piece mm -hmm. of track, anything could have been obscuring or could have been an IED. Uh, but if you're focused on that as you're rolling towards your mission, uh, then you're not doing the things that you're supposed to be doing uh, as a leader. Uh, and we had some capabilities to try to uh, mitigate some of those risks. Uh, and you got to trust that, trust the guys in the turret that are on lookout for those sorts of things. Um, and then you got you to gotta execute that mission. So your focus has to be on the mission, not worried about if I'm going to come home or not. Oh, wow. Fascinating. Wow. Jack, I'm glad you made it home. And uh, the world of uh, novel writing is much better for it. Uh, we, we're good friends with a guy named John Sanford who writes the Prey books, Rules yeah. of Prey, Eyes of Prey. He's a good friend of ours. And uh, he once said that uh, you, you've made it if your books are selling in the airport and your books are selling in the airport. <laughs> it's an honor to see. Every time I walk by, I sneak in with my I carry a pen. Every time I go in, I go in and I, I, uh, I sign them and I put them back on the shelf. Cool. Oh, cool. Oh, that's cool. Yeah.
Uh, Jack, this is going to have to be the first of many, many, many interviews with Garage Logic. Let's do it. You guys are, are awesome, and it's uh, so fun to talk to you. And knowing the connection to Vince Flynn is just uh, is incredible. So uh, thank you guys for. Uh, Can't wait for the new book. And thank you very much, Jack. It was great to talk to you. Great talking thank to you. you. Guys. Thank you. Great. Now go back to work. Yeah, get to work. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. Come on it. What the hell is All going right. on here? Thanks, right. Jack. Thank Bye, you. Guys. You bet. Want to take a break? Yes, sir.